Um, I'm going to turn over to Randy now. Randy's going to uh, explain the pen world to us from his point of view. Uh, spotlight for everybody. You ready to go, Randy? Yep. Let's see if I can share my screen. Yep. John, while he's getting that set up, one comment to make on that uh, PDF that you sent out. Uh, I skimmed it. I don't remember all the detail, but you might make mention that these, some of these, especially the other clubs that we in Lancaster also have one of the camera booms that uh, AAW uses. Oh, yeah, that's in there. There's a picture of it in the PDF, actually. Okay. Yeah, we are going to use that. We're going to need it. Okay, over to you, Randy. Give us the story. I'm going to make this your screen as big as I can, at least in the recording. And I want you all guys to all know that up beside the green bar or, or whatever about shoe screen, you might have the option to make his images large if he doesn't do that for us. Yeah, I'm full screen now. Okay. Um, I'm going to divide this up into uh, required tools, good tools to have, and optional tools. And I prefer to think of it as operations rather than tools, because there are lots of different ways to do what you need to do. The required tools are on the screen. You need a pen kit. You need a mandrel. It has a taper that will fit into your taper of your lathe. It has a thumb nut usually. You'll have bushings, which are used to mount the uh, pen blanks onto the, onto the mandrel and you'll have a pen blank. The pen blanks are about five eighths up to about an inch in uh, square and about five to six inches long. Um, there are lots of different materials you can use, not only wood, but all kinds of acrylics, everything you can possibly imagine. The, the, somebody's made a pen kit of it. Um, there's also, uh, you can make them out of bone uh, horn. Uh, there are synthetic materials. You can make them out of stone, all kinds of materials. This is a bushing. This goes on the mandrel, and you can see on the left here, there's a hole in it that matches that mandrel. Now, mandrels are usually seven millimeters or a D size, and this uh, mandrel will fit. Uh, this bushing will fit right on that mandrel. This is a side view here that this is the size that you're looking for to make the pen blank. This goes inside the tube, the brass tube that is that the pen is, uh, is built, built on. Now you're going to need some centers. Uh, most notably, you're going to need a live center in your tailstock. This has a 60 degree point on it. And the reason for that is the end of the mandrel that has, hits the tailstock has a small hole in it that mount that uh, captures this uh, live center. There's also items made like a mandrel saver. This actually goes around the mandrel. And this is a dead center, a drive center. And that'll be seen a little bit later. And these are the parts after you take them out of the bag and all the little baggies. I jokingly tell people that if the police ever raid my house, they're going to find all these little tiny little plastic bags. <laughs> um, and these are the pen uh, parts that normally go over the pen. This is a fave pen made by Penn State Industries. And these are the operations you need. I'm not going to go through them one by one. You can, you have to do these, but you can use any kind of tool that you have. You have to cut the blanks to length, but you can use a table saw, a band saw, a chop saw, even a small miter box with a miter saw will work, or even a scroll saw. Notice that the first page, this is here at the top, is where we turn the pen down to the size. <laughs> When I get to the turning the pen, I'm about two thirds of the way finished with it. Uh, and this is a jig that I use to, uh, to uh, cut the pen blanks. You have to cut them to about the length needed plus about a 30 second of an inch. This has a spacer here that I put the tube in 
And then this distance right here is the same as the distance from here to here plus a 32nd of an inch. And so this is something I made and none of this is uh, unique to me. That's a nice looking jig. I want to see it in action. Uh, I didn't take any videos of it. Okay. Unfortunately. Another time. Uh, there are a lot of different jigs that will uh, work. And again, this is just something I made and it fits on my uh, sled that goes on my table saw. So these are the blanks that have been cut with the tubes in front of them. And I marked the tubes. You can see the cross I put in the middle. One side is the cap side, the other side is the nib side. And I do that because I wanna match the grain when I build the pen. And now we're gonna drill the hole and I use a centering vise and uh, it goes under my drill press. This is a centering type vise. It holds the blank vertically so it can be drilled accurately. And now the drip, the hole for the tube will be drilled through the blank. Randy, do you, uh, when you're drilling that hole, do you start from the center line of the pen so that the, the hole is, um, if there's any deviation in the, in the um, drill as it goes down, it still stays with the grain? No. Uh, as long as you make the pen, as long as the uh, hole comes out the other end and it has enough space, it doesn't matter if it's a bit offset. So, so why wouldn't you drill it by putting the blank in a pin chuck and drilling and drilling on the lathe? Yes, you can do that also. Uh, this is the way I do it. But yes, it is certainly possible to uh, put the blank in the uh, in a pin chuck or some kind of a holder and then drill it with a uh, drill bit in the tailstock. And there are a lot of people that actually do that. I find this convenient because I make about five or six pens at a time. Where'd you get the centering vise? Is that um, There'll be a number of sources at the end. Uh, this is one that was made by Paul Hoffman. Uh, it's a very well-made uh, vise and it works smooth as anything. And it centers the blank exactly so your drill bit hits the center of the blank. Randy's given me a list of his sources that I'm going to send out tomorrow. Right. Now here, this is a close-up of the blanks. They've been drilled and I used uh, thick super glue, but you can use polyurethane like Gorilla Glue, or you can use epoxy to glue the tubes in. Uh, you have to make sure that you don't get any glue inside the tube. Um, so, uh, but you can use any one of the three and uh, each one has pros and cons. So how do you guarantee you don't get any glue inside the tube when you're pushing the tube through glue? What you do is you put the, is you uh, block the end of the tube up with uh, either Play-Doh. Uh, I use uh, dental wax, which comes in sheets. Uh, some people will actually use a slice of a potato. But anything to keep the glue out. Why wouldn't you just turn a little tapered plug? Yeah, you could do that as well. Okay. Why not? That's, that's overkill. <laughs> Why not glue the uh, insert before you put it in and then just slide it in? The glue will bubble up around the end of it and enter the other, the pushing end. Yeah, oh. as you push it in, the, the glue will get on the end. Okay. And you definitely want, you, you'll have to clean out that glue if any gets in there. That has to be squeaky clean. Uh, this is my dust hood. Smile. This is my dust hood. Uh, it fits on my lathe and it has magnets underneath that stick to the, the bedways and it has dust collection on it. And also it has a Lexan shield on top. When you're making pins, the only thing I worry about is uh, my eyes. Um, pens are not that big and not that heavy. So 
I don't really worry about that hitting me except for my eyes. This allows me to, uh, to put that hood down and then I don't have to worry about it. And I can reach underneath it with my tools. So this is size specifically to pens. Uh, you can make and small any kind stuff. of small like bottle stoppers, um, yep. duck calls, any kind of thing like that. And, and again, this isn't unique to me. Uh, I do have a diagram, but the only critical dimension on this is this little cutout right here. Yeah. That is size to the so distance between the spindle nose and the bedways on your lathe. So uh, you have to kind of customize it that way. That it looks like it would only work with pen mandrels, but if you're doing small spindle work requiring a chuck, you'd probably have to come up with a little different arrangement, huh? Yes, yeah, you would. Uh, I do use it with my sanding jig though. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Uh, this is a brass gun brush. I can never say that right. Uh, it's uh, used to clean out the barrel, gun barrels and it consists of a bunch of different brass brushes. And this is what I use to uh, clean out any glue that might be inside the tubes. And uh, sometimes I'll have to use an X-Acto knife as well. Now, the one thing that you have to do is that you have to mill or grind the end of the blank so it is perpendicular to the to the tube that's in the blank not to the outside of the tube but to the tube that's in the blank and so this has four cutters this goes into the into the tube and then the cutters will mill the uh, pen uh, will mill the end of the blank so it's perpendicular. And if you don't do that, uh, you, you can get uh, uh, uneven joins between uh, the pens, uh, blanks and the fittings. This is a camphoring tool. I use this because it makes the, uh, the brass tube. I just stick this on the end, give it a couple twists and it camphors the end of the brass tube so that uh, it uh, it, uh, it makes it easier to push the fittings in. The fittings are normally pressed into the, uh, into the blanks. This is another nice to have. I, it's almost required, but it's a transfer punch set. And you can get these for about 10 or $20 at uh, Harbor Freight. And they're handy uh, for all kinds of things with making pens. Now, I do not use a pen mill or a barrel trimmer. I use a sanding jig. And uh, this is the tail part of the sanding jig and a draw bar that holds it onto the tail stock. And next, this is the sanding jig in use. I have a small disc sander that goes on here. And there's a pin that goes into the sanding block in the tail stock. And next, I believe we'll have a video showing how this works. Normally, uh, what I'll do is uh, sand down until I hit the uh, brass tube in the ends. Uh, that one, I wasn't quite all the way down to it, but that's normally what you do. And then I use the camphoring tool to remove any burrs on the ends of the brass tubes. Randy, is there any reason I couldn't do that with a skew chisel? 
Uh, no, you could use a skew chisel for that, but you'd have to be really careful. I would hold it on a dead level with then use it as a scraper. Yeah, you could likely do that, but remember, uh, you'd have to you'd have to align it with the inside with the tube that's inside there. Yeah, that would be the skill challenge. You would learn how. To, I mean, uh, for me, I would uh, if I could learn how to do that with my tools rather than uh, additional jigs. I would go there just as a choice in wood turning, and I don't mean that in any way to be critical. Just to just that, that's. My interest in pen turning is is the question, can I do this with the tools that I have or do I have to buy all this stuff? Uh, no, you don't have to buy all this stuff. All of it is is fairly cheap and you can always come up with, uh, with workarounds for everything. In fact, what you could do is take that transfer punch, put it in, the, in a Jacob's chuck in the tailstock, put a small piece of sandpaper in your headstock, and then sand it down that way. Sure. And, okay. and you would have all that except for the transfer punches. So here is, I've laid out the bushings and the blanks. And the next thing is we're gonna assemble it onto the mandrel and then we're gonna start turning it. Okay. There's our pen mandrel. And it has a spacer on it. I'm going to put on the bushing on the end. One blank. Bushing in the middle. The cap point. And the bushing on the end. And now, one more spacer. And this gets tightened down. This can go away. This now goes into the headstock, the paper end. This is the 60 degree live center. That goes into the tailstock. That goes up. This walks down. And we're ready to turn. I hope that's the last recording I have to do with that. <laughs> I did that about eight times. <laughs> so, Randy, what would you say is the difference between a mandrel and a jig? It's just the name. It's it's just called a mandrel. Um, I, I it, there's no real difference. Thank you. Now this shows uh, the the uh, mandrel saver in operation. The mandrel saver pushes directly on the bushing rather than using a thumb nut. Uh, it eliminates uh, one more uh, part where you could get uh, inaccuracies in your, in your pen. Where, where is that in the picture, please? Uh, it's right in this area. This is the mandrel saver. Oh, I see it now. Thank Other you. than a 60 degree live center, this is a live center with a hole in the middle that exactly fits the mandrel. Almost all mandrels are seven millimeters or 0.246, a D size. And so uh, a lot of people like this. I don't normally use it, but I have one. Now the next thing you're gonna need, and this is a really a required uh, tool is some kind of digital calipers, and you can get them from, oh, almost the Harbor Freight has them on special a lot for like 10 bucks. And you don't need a real accurate one. I prefer the digital rather than an analog cal uh, caliper, because one of the things you can do is you can use it to set the target size you are looking for. And you do that by putting the calipers on the fitting you're trying to match up with and pressing the zero button. And now you can see how much oversize you are when you're turning. And here I'm starting to turn these, uh, these pen blanks down. 
this shows me that I'm 75 thousandths of an inch uh, over my target size. And I try to be within about three thousandths of an inch of, of the fitting size. One of the things you, uh, that I found out, this is a good trick to learn, is I lay the back of a tool across the bushing while the lathe is running. If it bounces or vibrates, then I have to find out where it's where I'm out of round. And uh, you'll have run out and uh, your pen blank will be thicker on one side than on the other side. It'll be really noticeable. And that's just a trick I picked up a long time. That's a good tip. Now okay, here I- This I'm, is the uh, dead center. I'm gonna go back to the previous one. Uh, next, we're gonna look at turning between centers. Um, this has come up in the last couple of years as a way of eliminating a lot of the inaccuracy of bushings and the pen mandrel that you use. And so turning between centers allows you to very accurately turn a pen kit. Okay, this is the uh, dead center uh, that was uh, in the first part of the presentation. And we're gonna look at it now and it's used for turning between centers. So this goes into the headstock, then you get these turn between center bushings. And you'll notice that these have no hole in the middle. They are intended only for this purpose. And what we're going to do is put them in from this end and put the other one in from this end. Then they'll go onto the live center. Do you want And 60 degree tailstock comes up and it's squeezed in between here. And now we can turn one barrel at a time very accurately. Yeah, turning between centers, uh, the bushings that are made by the different companies that produce pens tend to be not of the highest specs. And so, uh, uh, people came, pen makers mostly came up with turn between centers as a way of making pens a lot more accurately because the bushings that the uh, machinists make tend to be much uh, higher quality and uh, turned down and sized to much uh, tighter specs. So on that method, I could turn a bushing in boxwood or pearwood and use it, it seems to me, yeah? Yes, yes. And uh, I, I would... I would tend to use some kind of synthetic like uh, Corian or uh, one of the synthetic materials. But yeah, a lot of people do do that. Now here I am, uh, I've done turning and I sanded these uh, blanks uh, from about 220 up to about 600 grit. Uh, and now they're ready to actually uh, be finished. And what I'm going to do is put these small cone-shaped bushings that are shown here, and I'm going to apply a super glue, a CA finish to the pens. Pens get handled a lot, and most finishes won't stand up to constant use. And so these cone centers actually uh, keep the CA from getting underneath and from getting um, onto the mandrel, which would be bad. So, so um, Randy, you mentioned about the, the um, handling, getting a lot of use. Um, what's the advantage of having the um, mandrel so accuracy, accurate when you get to the end, end pen? It seems to me that you're spending a lot of energy on something that's not necessarily going to give you, well, it doesn't really have an impact on the final part final product as far as the user is concerned. It may have as far as you're concerned, but not as far as the user is concerned. Yeah, but if the, the, the point is, if you 
don't turn the pens very accurately. Um, the feel of the pen is terrible. Uh, okay. It's either turn, turned oversized, which is not too bad, but if you turn a pen barrel undersized, uh, and my first one, I did that. Uh, I still have it, and I still, it's laying right here in front of me. <laughs> and it is terrible to hold in your hand. You can feel that that edge is lower, the barrel is lower than the fitting, and it just feels terrible. So, so what you're trying to say is you're trying to protect against overshoot as far as cutting. Yes, yes. And, and the general rule is try to eliminate anything that causes errors in sizing or round or, or roundness or concentricity. So you're trying, you're trying to be accurate, uh, as accurate as you can. And I'm going to apply a thin CA finish on this. Uh, I use about four or five coats. When I'm done, uh, I will, uh, as a final step, use four aught steel wool. And that makes a pen, that creates a pen that feels like wood, but it has this super glue finish on it. Now the next one, here's a close up of these cone bushings. Uh, you can get these at, at Woodcraft if you want. Uh, the other option is to make sure that you definitely want to wax your bushings and the mandrel. You do not want to super glue <laughs> your blanks to the mandrel. And here I am pressing in. Now, they do make pen presses, uh, pen assembly presses. And there are a bunch of different ones. There's probably a, a good six or eight different companies that make these. But what I do is I don't like a single task tool. So what I did was I put a wood jaws on my wood turning or my woodworking uh, vise, and I press the uh, parts together. You have to make sure you align the part uh, with the fitting with the barrel, and then you press it in until it seats. And here I'm pressing. Press that I use sometimes was a drill press. Uh, there are, a, again, there are a bunch of different ways to do this. Uh, I have some small uh, uh, plastic blocks that actually fit in the lathe and can be used with the tailstock to press uh, the pens together. But yeah, a drill press, uh, people will take a, a bolt, uh, put it into the drill press and then use it to press the, the pen together. Uh, I've even seen people use uh, squeeze can clamps. Almost anything will work to squeeze the pen uh, together uh, as long as they're easily controllable. Well, in the and, drill uh, press, you could clamp a block on the table, drill a hole for that the pointy part that would perfectly anchor it underneath the quill and then drill and, and go from there. I mean, you, it would be pretty easy to set up dead on. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, in this case, uh, one of the things I know is that there's a metal piece that sticks out of this center band. And I don't wanna press on that piece because it's rather delicate. And so I made a block up that pushes only on the outside of that, of that, uh, that center band. It doesn't push on the inside at all. And here I am, this is a bit off center. Uh, pressing the finial ends at the top cap. And this is a, a source of, uh, of, of sources of different pen making supplies. Um, the International Association of Pen Turners, uh, IAP, is located at, at that website. Great bunch of guys, they can explain anything to you. Uh, the IAP also produced a, an app called Bushings and Tubes, which you can get either for Apple or for Android devices. And there are also charts on the IAP website uh, to do any kind of uh, uh, 
uh, to the, basically duplicate the bushings and tubes. Uh, but this gets uh, updated as more pens and newer pen styles become available. Suppliers of pen materials, Woodcraft, the Woodcraft in Harrisburg has quite a lot of uh, pen kits in stock. And I try to give them my business when I can uh, because I want them to be there when I need something. Uh, exotic Blanks, Ed and Dawn are really great people to know. I'm convinced that they have a time machine that they send the that orders back in time because I order something and a day later it's here. And they're in Wisconsin. I'm gonna put this list out in the chat in the follow-up tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Penn State Industries, Berea, Craft Supplies. Colin Sean's Woods produces uh, pen blanks that are laser cut uh, with all kinds of designs in the, in the blank. Fish, um, hunt for supplies for hunting and all kinds of things. Uh, Rick Harrell, who's on IAP, uh, makes that sanding jig uh, and a bunch of other things like uh, tool posts and, uh, and uh, tool uh, rests, uh, they're modular. Uh, he doesn't do this as a profession. He doesn't do this for money. He, he does it as a service to the pen making community. And uh, you can contact him at his email address, or you can look on penturners.org uh, for all the uh, different items he has available. MSC, which is Manhattan Supply Company, sells all kinds of drill bits and machining parts and all kinds of things. Uh, they have a warehouse in uh, Jonestown, which is right near the intersection between Route uh, 78 and 81, where they're split. A uh, little machine shop sells uh, parts and tools to the small metal lathe community. Uh, they're in California, but a lot of their uh, items are applicable to uh, either woodworking or, or uh, pen making. And ta -da, this is the pen that uh, you saw me create. Uh, it's a faith pen. The center band says faith, hope, and love. Randy, um, super all, show. There's all kinds of embellishments you can apply to a pen. This is one I did quite a few years ago. Uh, it's a Celtic knot pen. Uh, it's an inlay pen. And I have a jig that I use for inlays, but I'm going to uh, close out at this point. Questions? How many pens have you made, Randy? You ever keep track? <laughs> Hundreds. Hundreds? <laughs> at least. Randy, I'm going to stop your share and go to the gallery okay. view so we can do questions. We don't ordinarily have such a long and detailed show as that, but uh, Randy volunteered it, and I know oh, that's too good to pass up. So, questions for Randy? Pretty well covered it in a lot of detail. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I find it pretty. I, I don't think I'm ever going to make more than one or two pens, just to be sure I know how. But uh, I'm always interested in precision techniques and way of ways of getting control over hand processes that are very much at risk if you screw it up and uh, ways of making it work and get the accuracy you need for a project. I find all of that really interesting. Uh, Randy, I see um, you, you probably turn a lot of wood pens. We have somebody here that's that's done a lot of pens and he indicated when he was selling them that the acrylics outsold wood, I think something like nine to one. Do you have a similar experience? Uh, yes. Um, they, they, the, the shine on the, an acrylic pen uh, sells a lot of pens. Hmm. How about precious metals? Do they go for gold and ru rubium, ru rubidium or rubidium. something like that? <laughs> no. Uh, normally, the, the fittings are either uh, silver or gold, uh, but they make them in black titanium and a couple of other uh, uh, other finishes. Um, uh, there are also people 
that make what are called kitless pens. They don't have a kit that they come with. They make everything. They thread the, the pieces, they cast the pieces, they drill them out. It's, it's quite a process. Wow. wow. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'm going to move us along. It's, uh, we got about another 20 minutes, so we'll get to visit a few more people.